Hello, everyone, and I'd like to welcome you all to episode two of our McGillan Partners video series, Open Book, where we invite industry and market leaders to discuss current trends and debate on topics and events affecting both the insurance market and more broadly. This week, I'm absolutely honored and delighted to welcome Hank Greenberg, who is a man that really needs absolutely no introduction. Hank is the chairman of Star Companies. Prior to his position at Star, he was the chairman and CEO of AIG, a former Star subsidiary which became the first fully licensed foreign insurance company in China. Under his nearly 40 years of leadership, AIG grew from an initial market value of $300 million to a $180 billion firm, becoming the largest insurance company in the world. Among Hank's numerous awards and appointments, Hank serves as Vice Chairman of the National Committee on the United States-China Relations, Honorary Vice Chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations, and as a member of the board of the US-China Business Council. In 1990, he was appointed by Zhu Rongji as Shanghai's first chairman of the International Business Leaders Advisory Council. Hank has been named an honorary citizen of Shanghai and was appointed as a senior economic advisor to the Beijing municipal government. He has also been and still is a trusted advisor to a number of US presidents and leaders. Hank is considered one of the greatest business leaders in the world and it just so happens that we're incredibly fortunate that he also works in the insurance industry. So it's a great honor for me to compare notes uh, with my good friend Hank and uh, I'd like to start off before going on the journey through his life and career by seeing how Hank is faring in this extraordinary lockdown period working remotely and not traveling, Hank. It's been unusual for you, isn't it? It's uh, difficult to not to travel when you're a global company as we are. And I miss it very much. Uh, I'm in touch with our people uh, at least once a week, all of them, the U.S. first, and then the international people. Uh, and I'm happy to say they're all in good shape. Working from home uh, has become a kind of a habit now for most companies. And they're finding things that they didn't know before. And I'm not, I'm not sure they'll go back the way it was completely uh, when this is over. There are many jobs that can be done from home given technology that exists today and the loyalty of many people. Uh, you can cut down the space you're occupying in large expensive buildings and that's going to be reflected very shortly I believe in the industry. So there's something good to come out of that. Uh, as far as when we're going to go back uh, to our offices, as you've seen uh, currently, the states that, that began to loosen up very quickly are paying a price for it. Uh, it is a very, very difficult price. You affect the lives of people. I'm not going to do that. I am not going to jeopardize the life and health of our employees by insisting that they go back to work in the office. We're not going to do that. Uh, we'll only do it when it's safe. And then there are many people can work effectively from home going forward. And we'll pursue yeah. that. And we'll pursue that. Uh, we want uh, uh, business getters and underwriters who understand 
business uh, to me when we can talk to them. And they've got to be out in the field, many of them, doing what we do normally, work with brokers and try and get as much business as we can. And uh, I'm convinced we'll do that quite, quite well. Great. So, and uh, how, how are you finding technology yourself? Pretty good. Excellent. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I miss the, I do miss comparing notes with you in person, but it's great to, to have you and talk remotely uh, on, on this uh, open book series. So, uh, and again, thank you for, for the time. Going back um, through your extraordinary life, Hank, it's difficult to know what to sort of pick up from from everything you've done and, and achieved. But uh, but right at the start, it's fair to say you came from pretty humble, modest beginnings, didn't you? I mean, farm in yeah. upstate New York. And take can you take us through that little that journey because it went from there into enlisting and, and actually fighting in the war. Actually, I think you were underage, um, and it was just after Pearl Harbor. Yeah, uh, I grew up in a little town. I grew up in a little town called Swan Lake. Uh, uh, my father died. When I was very young, I think I was uh, about five years old, my mother uh, became a manicurist. We, we lived with my uh, grandparents uh, after that. My mother took us to the to Swan Lake in the summer as a, as a resort. We spent the summer there and um, she married ultimately a gentleman uh, who lived there and had a very big farm. And uh, so I grew up there. I grew up on a farm, uh, which was hard work, but uh, uh, but uh, uh, very pleasant work. Uh, I got to know all about farming. And I used to have a, a trap line. I learned how to trap. Uh, I'd get up at four o'clock in the morning to visit the traps, and um, I did quite well. I caught a trap of many different uh, small animals and sold their skins. So it was a it was a good life. Uh, I played football in high school, and that, that's when the war broke out, and um, you couldn't travel. They were saving gasoline which was a shortage of, and so you couldn't travel to other um, uh, high schools to play football. So the season, so the season ended, and I got bored, and I, I lied my age, uh, hitchhiked to Newburgh, New York, where there was an enlistment office, went in and uh, enlisted. The guy said, because you look very young, you need your mother's signature. So I get it. I went, I went outside and signed her name. <laughs> <laughs> and I was in the military. Um, I, I, I trained out in the Midwest. Um, and, um, and I was sent to Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, um, to school for a while, and then I went to England. I was there a year before the invasion, and I was training others besides having been trained myself. I spent a year doing that, and I promoted very quickly. I became a sergeant, you know, about 18 and a half years old, uh, and moved up in rank uh, throughout the war. I was off in a regular army commission uh, but I didn't have to leave the platoon that I was leading for, for the whole war. I didn't want to do that. So I stayed where I was. Uh, when the war ended uh, in Europe, we had linked up with the Russians in Linz, Austria, K-1 
came back to Germany and I was waiting for orders to go come back home. Uh, I was offered an appointment to West Point if I wanted to stay in the military. I wasn't sure I wanted to do that. I, I, I can't decide that right now. And so I didn't take that. But I, I, I came back. I stayed in the reserves. I was commissioned in the reserves. I needed the money when I was going to school, uh, which I did. I finished uh, high school, uh, college, and law school. And then the Korean War broke out. And I was I was a company commander in, uh, in Korea. Uh, that's a different, I, I would tell you, that's a different uh, experience. You're responsible for other people's lives. And, and I had a policy. I wouldn't ask anybody, anyone to do anything that I wouldn't do, ever. And uh, I went through the war that way. I was lucky to come out alive. It was, very, it was a very difficult war. Um, I was glad to come out alive. Came back, had to get a job. I went to visit some of the guys I went to law school with. They were all struggling. But I left their office. As you mentioned, I went down the street, saw the Continental Casting building, went in. The, the, uh, HR guy was a real jerk. He was a jerk. So I went down to the lobby to see who was running the office. And Bob Raul Reed, um, I busted into his office and I said to him, you got an asshole for it, for an HR guy. He thought I was going to hit him. <laughs> so I said, sit down. I did. We talked for about an hour. I left with the job. What was going to be, I had no idea. And I became, in a couple of years, the youngest assistant vice president. They moved me to Chicago. And I moved up the ranks very quickly. I was a vice president at a very young age in that company. And um, that's how I started. And, uh, so, Hank, like many, you, you actually got into the insurance industry Actually, in a, in a way, by mistake or by a fluke, you were walking down William Street in Lower Manhattan, New York in 1952, and then you happened to walk into Continental Casualties office, and previously exactly. you were a law student. I, I finished law school. I was admitted to the bar, and uh, but getting a job in a law firm in New York was very difficult. There are many... There are many lawyers that came back from World War II and they flooded the market. Yeah. Interesting. So you went to Chicago with Continental Casualty. You were very successful there, as you, you were just describing. And, and how did you then go from um, Continental Casualty to CV Star that then went from there into AIG. It's, I'm sure that uh, people watching this be fascinated by how your career developed from there. The uh, president of Continental Cashley, New Star, and he was uh, traveling to Asia uh, on a vacation and he ran into Star. Star, of course, um, had a business in Asia. He had the what was called the AIU, which was a uh, essentially a general agency representing American companies uh, uh, in Asia. And he uh, he had learned how to ski at an, at an advanced advanced age. Started, and he went to a ski shop in Tokyo, where skis were being made by hand by the owner. And he broke one of the skis 
uh, when he was testing his, his flexibility. He was very upset. So he, had, he started to talk to uh, the owner. And the owner had a son who was on a Japanese ski team. And they were trying to find time to practice, but there was no snow that time of the year uh, in Japan. So a star volunteered to send the whole team to Switzerland to practice, which he did. He paid the whole, the whole team in, in Switzerland. And then he wanted to teach the kid something about the insurance business. And so the president who was traveling there got in touch with me. And I said, sure, you can send him and we'll do what we can to train him. And he spent about six months with me in Chicago. And Star came to visit him a couple of times. And it was very clear he was interested in hiring me. I wasn't, I wasn't uh, looking for a job. I was doing quite well. But uh, things changed in Continental casually at a time that I, I, I became vulnerable then. And so I, I did join STAR. And I, my first job was to build an A&H uh, department. And we did it very successfully. It became the largest international A&H uh, business in the industry in a very short time. He owned a company in the United States called the American Home, which was an utter failure. As all small um, property casualty companies were, uh, their expense ratio was way too, uh, much too high. The automobile business was terrible. They were one of them, many of the same. And he urged me to take the job yeah, of running it. It was no, he wasn't doing me a favor at <laughs> the time. I said I would do it on condition that I do what I have to do. Uh, I, don't, I don't want any second guessing. He said, okay, you have the authority to do it. I reinsured out the entire business in the Continental Insurance Company. Got rid of all the agents that started business with brokers only, large commercial risk. I hired a half a dozen guys from London who understood that business. We were off and going. Uh, so we did, that did very well. Uh, so um, we bought then the New Hampshire Insurance Company which is part of the AIU family. Uh, and uh, that was a good company. And I started several others. And we built what became known as AIG. Uh, I left the CV Star and Company out of AIG. I kept it uh, on its own, not doing anything. Uh, and we built AIG, as you pointed out, the largest insurance company in history. That record has never been beaten by anybody. And you became CEO of, of AIG in, I think, the late 60s, was it, was it not? Yeah. And then you, you built it from there, which was, which was truly extraordinary. And, uh, and that's where I had the privilege of um, doing lots of deals um, with you and your your colleagues. When when you look back and reflect on your career in the insurance industry and leadership and the importance of talent, what what advice do you have for for my colleagues who are uh, building a business brand new with me, looking to the future with a lot of excitement and confidence? There's a couple of things that were different then that very hard to replace. Um, as you know, I fought in the Korean War. Came back when I started to work for Star. Uh, there were three other officers 
who had fought in the war. And each of them from World War II uh, had a different area of the business to start. They understood uh, when you gave an order, they had to be carried out. There was no second guessing uh, or arguing. They saluted and carried it out. And so I had the fortune of having about three or four at the time, uh, senior guys in the company who had been in the military service and knew what carrying out orders meant. And uh, uh, they did a great job. And we worked together to build the biggest company in our industry and history. I'm very proud of what they did. I mean, the interesting thing as well, Hank, you know, when you were building AIG with with the, the world-class talent you had, you had an uncanny knack, I remember, of having the strategic vision for the for the firm to be a truly international, uh, world-class class firm. But you could also get into the detail. And, and I remember years and years ago uh, when I was uh, at Jardine Lord Thompson, I was traveling on business in actually San Francisco at the time. And this was when AIG was nearly a $180 billion market cap. And you called me up to chase me down on a Russian DNO premium that we had outstanding for half a million dollars. And you <laughs> called me personally on the phone to make sure we paid it, which we, which we did. We'd been a little remiss in, in making the payment. But I always reflected on how extraordinary it was that you could have that balance between being a leader of a very large business, but actually having that personal touch where you could get right into the detail if you needed to. I do it today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, when we talk about defining moments in history and you know this period is is obviously one of them um you know and you talked about um uh the, the second world war and you talked about um the korean war the second world war uh, i think you you also you landed on omaha beach and you actually went through uh and fought across europe um under general Patton at the time uh with um uh, with, you know, all the armies there going through. But I, I remember, I think it was four years ago now, you were in London getting uh, a Lifetime Achievement Award and, and I was privileged to be your guest at, uh, at uh, the, the dinner and the, and the event. And, and I remember a very senior figure from a major European insurance company who'd never met you before, but came and actually introduced um, himself to, to, to you and the three of us were having a, a conversation. And he came up to thank you for liberating, I think it was the Dachau concentration camp. And you were one of the first American soldiers into that camp if I'm not mistaken and it I have to say it was an incredibly touching moment to hear you know one industry figure talking to another iconic industry figure and having that perspective and and that situation to you know thank you for liberating actually his father well it was very a moving experience for me I didn't think that uh, uh, people do what they did to, you, uh, to other humans. And uh, I tell you, even today, uh, it's hard to believe what went on. The first person I met, Doc, I was a little man. He probably was no more than five foot tall. He could barely walk. He put his arms around me and asked me if I was, he asked me in, in Hebrew, I don't speak Hebrew, um, if I was Jewish. And I said, yes. He started to cry. 
uh, wouldn't let me go. Made me cry, actually. It was a very touching moment. Uh, Amazing. I mean, another defining moment was uh, was 9/11, and uh, and actually, um, I had a, a bit of a near miss because I was uh, I was actually in New York that weekend, and and I flew out on the 10th of September, Monday, the 10th of September, to San Francisco on the United flight that went down on the 11th of September and it was a flight from Newark to San Francisco and I was going on the 11th of September because my daughter's birthday was on the 11th of September and uh, and I was going to see her and she was living out there but but you had an even nearer miss I, th I think on actually the 11th of September if I remember correctly. I tried I was supposed to speak at the top floor of that restaurant. <clears throat> In the World Trade Center? Yeah. Windows of the World? Yeah, and um, but they had to move it uptown because it was overcrowded. Uh, they had more people wanted to come than, than they could hold to move it uptown. If I hadn't, hadn't moved it, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. Incredible. Yeah. And you sort of harnessed the insurance industry, I remember, to actually get much needed insurance coverage. AIG was sort of leading the charge on that um, after 9-11, um, yeah. you know, with the airline industry. So, um, you know, that was, uh, again, an extraordinary time. And, and, and again, with... COVID-19, we're living in an extraordinary time, but uh, you're looking really healthy and, and safe, I have to say, and, and, and looking very well. I'm working hard. Uh, I feel pretty good. I try to get enough exercise. Uh, I'll keep doing this as long as I can. Well, I, I always used to enjoy, obviously, uh, our lunch is in the CV Star office in, in Park Avenue, but we, we sometimes would go to the Four Seasons restaurant and um, uh, you'd be having the chopped chicken salad, I think, and um, you'd be lecturing me on making sure I keep fit, giving me all the coaching, which and not only coaching on keeping fit, but what I eat. So um, So it's always been... Well received, your your advice on how to stay well and 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 healthy. Get enough exercise, my friend, and keep working. Uh, you're good at what you do, and you should keep doing it. Uh, I know you'll be successful, and uh, I look forward for us to working together. And uh, I'm glad to see you looking well right now. Thank you. Can can I just um uh, move on to China and your extraordinary sort of leadership on the world stage with with China, which, which I think goes back to the to the the mid seventies. Did that come through um, your connections uh, and leadership with with CV Star? Because obviously, CV Star was a very international business entrepreneur. Um, he founded the firm in 1919. He was based out of, um, was it Beijing or Hong no. Kong? No, uh, uh, Shanghai. Shanghai. Um, and was that where you had your sort of passion for China or, or were there other driving forces for that? When I joined Star, um, uh, he was living in New York, living where I am right now. We're at, we're at Moore Farm, where I am right now, which is where Star U.S. home was. And, uh, and he's buried not far from you, where you and I are talking, actually. Um, Star uh, built 
a uh, non-life business in Asia, starting in China. Uh, and then, of course, the war broke out, World War II, and he had to leave. He came back after the war and started again uh, back in Shanghai. He had an office on the Bund, which is a very famous street in Shanghai. And then, of course, they had their own revolution, and the communists won. Uh, anybody, all the foreigners left. He left at the time. Uh, they all moved money, many of them moved to uh, Taiwan. And uh, we had an office in Taiwan. And uh, so I never went back to China. Uh, he didn't believe that the communists uh, who ruled the country uh, would be uh, amenable to the work of capitalists, if you want to call it that. Um, when I succeeded Star, I traveled all through Asia because we had offices, uh, the AIU, um, almost every country. When we didn't, I started new offices. We were doing quite, but I always stopped in China. Here's a country with billions and literally billions of people. Uh, what, what closed itself off to the rest of the world and um, someday would have to be part of the rest of the world. I didn't discuss it with anybody, but I always stopped in China when I was traveling in Asia. Got to meet, there was one insurance company at that time, the PICC, People's Insurance Company. They had no, they had no knowledge of insurance. Uh, even though some of the people that worked for Star were working in, this, in the uh, PICC, so I started working with them, helping them. They were trying to export some things. We provided coverage, uh, either directly. Or, re or reinsured the PICC. I gradually met the leadership. Uh, and I met the mayor of Shanghai. And we became more than acquaintances. We were friends. Uh, a man called Zhu Rongji, who had been the mayor of Shanghai, became the premier of China. Uh, we were quite good friends. We are today. He's alive. And um, he, now he's, uh, he's retired, but he, he looks after uh, Xinhua University. It's the biggest and the, most, the best university in China. I'm on their board. Uh, I've been there for, for many years. So I made a lot of friends in China over the years. And uh, gradually we became uh, to do more of a more of a business. We got the market open. We got the first life insurance license uh, that was granted. It took many years to get that. And so we've been there for a long time. We have a very good uh, non-life business going. I'm going to start a life company very shortly uh, in China. We're going to do it differently. Well, China has developed um, amazingly. It's grown enormously, and more online business is done than any other country. Um, so, if you're selling insurance, you can do it online. You don't have brokers or agents for that class of business. They can work with you, but uh, so we're starting a new operation very shortly. Uh, I wish I could go to China right now, but I can't because of the weather, because of the illness. I have a lot of friends in China, and 
you know. And it's a two-way street. I've seen enormous change in China. Now, the, the problem going forward, obviously, is um, China's aspirations politically is to control a lot more than they currently do. Uh, they would like Taiwan back. They would like Hong Kong uh, not to resist uh, uh, Beijing. And they've been acting very aggressive with that. Uh, that's an issue we're going to have to deal with. Mm. Uh, so it, it's not without problems. Many things are not. We work to try and, and make it work. I can't tell you what's going to happen. I just don't know. Uh, well, you've been an extraordinary intermediary, I think, for um, every president, American president since Nixon in connecting with, with China. And, and I'm sure that your vast wealth of experience and connections are going to be really important as we navigate through the future of COVID-19, come out the other end and, and make sure that, um, you know, things settle down as, as best they can. Um, there's a lot of stress and tension and sensitivity in the world right now. You're absolutely right. China is now the second largest economy in the world. Uh, and uh, it's come on very quickly when you think about it. And uh, President Xi, is a, he, he is uh, determined uh, to expand China uh, in the areas that that influenced 150 years ago. And uh, so we'll see how it works out, you know. Yeah. I'm, I'm very much involved in it. I'm sure you are. I'm delighted to hear that as well. Looking at how you're building CV Star with extraordinary talent, you know, some of the great colleagues that in the industry work in, in CV Star, you're building a specialist uh, insurance and reinsurance business. And you know, we're on a parallel path as McGillan Partners. You know, I've recruited so far 230 colleagues. We're not trying to be all things to all people. Uh, we're doing some great business between ourselves and yourselves. We're very new. You know, we're only, um, to all intents and purposes, not even 12 months old in many respects. And, you know, you've been a great supporter of ours and a great friend. And and I'll never forget the when I was thinking about setting this up, the counsel you gave me and advice, and, and also the fact that you were prepared to support this venture financially meant a, a huge amount, which I'll never forget. But um, what advice would you uh, give us in thinking about the sort of future? And how do you think about STAR and, and the future of STAR? Because with the market the way it is, the insurance market and the conditions and, you know, yes, there's lots of challenges, but there seems to be a huge amount of opportunity as well. And what advice would you give us as a, as a new business, new startup on the block? Well, you're a new startup, but you're not new in the insurance business. Uh, you've learned a lot over the years. Uh, and um, I think we, you've learned well. Uh, work with companies that believe in underwriting. Uh, because that's the basic thing that you're selling and the thing that we do. Uh, and we, and we, if we fail to make an underwriting profit for any period of time, we'll soon be out of business. You have to make a profit in the business that you're in. If, if you don't do that, then you're going to lose. Not, not many companies are disciplined in, in, in uh, achieving an underwriting profit. Uh, they're more interested in getting the volume than they are the bottom line. That doesn't last long. 
as you know, you, if you look at the history. And so we're, we're a disciplined organization. And I think that I've always found you to be disciplined. You don't want to write business with a company that's going to lose money. It doesn't make any sense. You won't have that renewal for long, so you're wasting your time. You want to build relationships and do it the right way. If a customer that you do business with is not interested in the insurer making money, stay away from them. We're entitled to make a reasonable profit. Uh, otherwise, we're not in business. And so I know you believe that. And that's why we've become friends. Uh, we'll stick with you. And then you'll stick with us. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for that. And on back to Star, the, the, the one um, final comment or question I'd like to to ask you is um, it's about the Star Foundation. That that is an extraordinary success story. You know, when you when you if I understand it correctly, when you when you talk about um, the money that uh, was put into the Star Foundation maybe a long time ago of I think like fifteen million dollars and it's translated into billions of dollars today and it's really driving, you know, some incredible medical research projects and educations and stuff. How did that all evolve? And you've been absolutely front and center around and passionate about the Star Foundation, but that's in its own right an extraordinary success story. Strange you ask that. I'm going to have a meeting at the Star Foundation in about an hour, actually. Um, when Star died, before he died, he started a little foundation. He had no family. His company was a family. And uh, uh, he had $15 million in it. And $15 million at the time was not a small sum of money. Anyway, I became the head of the foundation. And after Star passed on, uh, Gordon Tweedy uh, preceded me. But he was, uh, he was not an insurance executive. Uh, he gave Star some legal advice from time to time. Anyway, I became the head of the foundation. It had a very minimal uh, $15 million. You couldn't do much. Um, it's worth billions of dollars today. We built it by making contributions out of our business since we were uh, privately held and uh, by investing wisely and uh, has a net worth of billions of dollars a day. We made investments in, as you pointed out, in medical research. Uh, I chaired New York Hospital, which now is one of the largest in the, in the country, if not number two or three. And uh, I did that when in a tiny uh, hospital. I built a building called the Star Building. Uh, we paid for it. I hired top flight physicians. And New York Hospital today is one of the best in the world. Um, and um, Cornell University uh, has a, uh, a campus in New York. Um, they have a medical school. This year, and I've been connected with them for years, been on their board for a long time, put them together with New York Hospital. Um, and they now have an alliance. The medical school is one of the top in the country. And one of the things I found out, when students graduate, medical school. They have a debt of about $100,000. So 
So they're spending the first number of years to try and pay their debt off. And so we put a plan in for the Star Foundation this year to pay the, to, to pay the tuition for medical school for all the students at Cornell. The, if, if we weren't the first, we were the second school, second foundation to do that. And, uh, the students love us, obviously, and uh, they can spend more time studying. They'll be better doctors when they come out. They don't have debt overhanging them. And I'm glad we're able to do it. That's fantastic. Well, Hank, you've been incredibly generous with, with your time today. I really appreciate comparing notes with you. I just wanted to thank you for your leadership, not, not only in the insurance industry, but, but on the world stage. I'd like to thank you for your mentorship throughout my entire career. And most of all, I'd like to thank you for my friendship with you. It's, it's, it's been a great journey together with you, and we've got lots to do going forward. Yes, we do. Um, I, I, I agree with everything you've said. Uh, I consider you a very close friend, a great ally, and I learn a lot from you when I see you. So thank you for taking the time also. Great. Thanks again, Hank, and we'll be, be in touch. All the best. I look, I look forward to it.